So we didn't share slides today, Dr. Asana and I, but um, you'll see something that's going to look very similar to the slide that he put up there. Um, but we've got another map of the United States. So just to orient you, he talked about how there's a national network of Alzheimer's disease centers. And um, we are a part of that network uh, at Northwestern with the ADRC here at Wisconsin. And there's a lot of red dots up there, and then there's a lot of lines that cross in between, so it looks slightly different than uh, Dr. Astana's map. Um, but it's showing the same thing. So those red dots represent the different Alzheimer's disease center. There's a few less than 32 up there because this map is from 2014. And as I said, we, as Dr. Astana said, we go through that competitive process whereby um, uh, different uh, ADCs are funded, and um, at that time there were a few less. And then the lines in between up here uh, represent not flight patterns or the distance that we're going back and forth to visit each other, but instead it re represents what we do best. And so our job is to collect data um, about from individuals like you to participate in our research and then collaborate with each other. And these lines represent collaborations that resulted in publications across the different Alzheimer's disease center. And if we had an updated map from now, there would be many more lines across our centers. Um, and the ultimate goal is to translate this information um, into, for individuals with, um, uh, um, to learn more about aging and dementia. And hold on, I see just one small problem here. So let me just fix something quickly. There we go. Okay. So today, I'm not here to just tell you about our Alzheimer's disease centers and how we get along so well, but I'm going to talk to you today about super aging. Before I can talk to you about super aging, though, I thought it was important to talk about normal aging and what is the difference between normal aging and super aging. And what, in this field, we often have some confusion around terminology. So I thought I'd first go over what are some common changes that are associated with aging. And it turns out that the news here or the things that we celebrate are often not very good when we think about aging. So we'll talk about the changes that happen to our eyesight. Um, the, so we tend to need glasses as we age. There tends to be other uh, changes that happen to the exterior of our body. So um, our skin may get wrinkled, our hair may turn gray, or it may fall out. And just like there are those changes that happen to the exterior of our body, we also see that there are changes associated with aging that happen um, inside the brain. So now we're looking at two brains, and it's as if we're cutting down right through the top here and looking forward. Um, and on those images up there, you'll see some boxes. And let's see if I can show them. Yes, it works, maybe. And so these boxes are outlining something called the hippocampus. And it turns out that the hippocampus is critical for memory. That's what helps us to remember. And the brain that's on the, your left-hand side is the brain of an average 87-year-old. And the brain that is on the right-hand side is that of a healthy 27-year-old. And if you look very closely, you'll see there's a lot of black space um, within that box of the 87-year-old, and that's not good news. That's where the hippocampus has shrunk. And when the hippocampus shrinks, that's related to our, that tends to be related to our memory performance. So you get a graph kind of like this that I'm going to blow up now and show a little bit larger. And across the bottom of the, what we call the x-axis is age by decade. And then moving up and down on what we call the y-axis is memory performance. And if we look at this, starting um, in our 30s and 40s is when our memory tends to peak. And if we look on average, memory tends to get worse with each subsequent decade. Now, if we were to just look at this graph in isolation, we might come to the conclusion that cognitive decline or changes in memory are an inevitable consequence of aging and that we could merely determine someone's memory age or their cognitive age by their chronologic age or by how old they were. But that news doesn't sound very good, does it? And that's not why we're here today, so stick with me through the tough part. Um, the truth is, if we think about how we all age, we know we age differently. And so this is the important part of not just looking at averages and what happens on average. Now I've got that same graph up there, but instead of looking at averages, now we've got lots of little dots up there, and they actually represent individual data points of real people. 
and we see a couple things that happen. So there's some highlighted portions in green, and that represents the average performance over the lifespan, and we see that that expands as we age. So when we're younger, ten, people tend to perform more similarly, and we get more variability with age. The other thing that we see is that there's some people up here who, are do, who I've uh, placed in triangles for emphasis, and they're doing better than expected, right? So they're doing better than average. In fact, they look like their younger peers. These are the individuals we were interested in studying for the Super Aging Project. We think they seem to avoid changes in memory that are so common that with age. So if I revise that statement that I put up there just a few minutes ago, cognitive decline may be co a common consequence of age, but it's not inevitable. And instead, our cognitive age or our memory age is probably determined by a combination of ex life experiences, genetic factors, and the passage of time. So if we look simply at some simplified aging trajectories, there's one that's um, pathologic aging, and this is the one that we would associate with Alzheimer's dementia. And there's uh, extreme amount of memory loss or change in our thinking skills. There's normal aging, where there may be some changes in memory. And our question was, could we find people who were super agers, people who had little to no memory loss? So that was kind of our idea, our big light bulb, our, our question. And then we had to put some rules around it as a scientist. So the rules for our study are that you have to be over age 80. And we use age 80 because those individuals are at the greatest risk for memory, uh, uh, changes in their memory, decline in their memory. And they have to have, those 80 plus year olds need to have memory performance at least as good as individuals in their 50s and 60s. And then performance in other thinking skills such as language um, and attention needs to be at least average for age. And then when we find these individuals, we ask them to come and participate in our research over time. Um, and to come back every, uh, for an, every 18 to 24 months and eventually at, um, donate their brain at the time of death, which sometimes can be a little bit squeamish but is a really essential part of the research. And I like to explain this kind of like um, when we got our first digital cameras, we were all very excited because we no longer needed film and we could take as many pictures as we wanted. And when we looked on the back of that camera, the picture looked great. And, but when we printed it out from the printer, all of a sudden our faces became little boxes because the resolution wasn't great. The resolution with which we, could, we can see during life is kind of like those initial digital cameras that weren't so great. But when we are able to um, look, um, when individuals donate their brain, we can actually see the cellular and molecular factors in much greater detail. So it provides us a resolution that's really informative for understanding what's happening in the brain. So what does the superaging study do? What are, what are we interested in? And I think we're interested in four biologic cores, first of all. So we're interested in knowing, okay, if these people have great memory performance, do they also have outstanding performance in their other thinking skills? Is, do they have outstanding um, or superior attention abilities? And then what does their brain look like? Does it look more like a 50-year-old brain or more like an, um, an average 80-year-old brain? And when we look under the microscope, what are those cellular and molecular factors? And so that's what we call histopathology. And then what are the genetic factors that are guiding this? Now we realize that things are much more complicated than just these four biologic cores. So we're also interested in lifestyle factors, education, family history, and psychosocial factors. And so what I'm going to spend uh, part of my time today is sharing some of those initial insights that we've had from that study. So, but before I do that, I thought you might like to know, well, are there any other studies of superagers going on, and how is it different than other studies of successful aging? And I want to point out uh, the really important term, successful aging. So it took us a, a while to really start to celebrate the idea that you could age well. And I'm really thankful for Rowan Kahn in 1999 when they published this book called Successful Aging, which I think shone a, a great spotlight on the positive aspects of aging. Now, the one consequence of that is that this idea of successful aging was very a, a general concept. And um, 
each individual research group decided to uh, define it a different way, which made it challenging to look for themes across research studies. And in fact, there was a review study done a few years ago that looked at the different definitions of successful aging. And they looked at 28 different studies and they found 29 different definitions <laughs> of successful aging. Um, I point this out not to say that that research was bad or anything negative about that, but um, it makes it challenging to then uh, draw conclusions across studies if we use different terminology. Um, and they also found that the proportion of successful agers varied from 0.4% to 95%, so virtually nobody to virtually everybody in the studies. Um, so we use the, the kind of quirky term superagers to distinguish it from successful aging because we have this very specific definition. Um, and if others are to use this, we ask that they use a similar uh, entry criteria so that we can generalize across the studies and learn. So why should we study superagers? Um, I think as a medical community, we've done a really great job at extending the lifespan so people are living longer and longer. But it's come at a consequence and there's a bit of an imbalance in that our health span isn't quite keeping up with our lifespan. So I think superagers represent a great group where we've got both longevity but also good health span. So if we can learn from them, um, they can help us potentially rebalance uh, this imbalance that we have currently. We also think that superagers have the opportunity to teach us about Alzheimer's disease. So one way to study Alzheimer's disease is to look at what's going wrong in the brain and try to fix that. And that's very important work. But we've also learned that Alzheimer's disease is quite complex. And so sometimes when you have a very complex problem, it's very useful to turn that problem on its head and look from a different vantage point. And that's what we're trying to do here by looking at individuals who are um, on the opposite end of the spectrum and doing quite well and how can we learn from them. And this is something that was recognized um, in something called the National Alzheimer's Project Act. And in the 2015 meeting, uh, they have these Alzheimer's research summits to keep us on track to meeting the goal of finding a, a, a treatment or a cure for Alzheimer's disease by the year 2025. And one of the goals that came out of the research summit was to understand all aspects of healthy brain aging um, and cognitive resilience to inform strategies of Alzheimer's disease prevention. And I think the super aging study fits in well there. So, Without further ado, I thought I would actually show you some data from our super aging cohort. So our first question was, we set up the rules, the entry criteria, but we didn't know if we could find the people. Um, so that was our first goal, was to actually see if we could find people who met the criteria. And of course we did, otherwise I wouldn't have been invited here today. Um, but to give you kind of a brief snapshot of what they look like and to try to convince you, um, again, that the superagers truly are performing uh, at least as well, if not better, than their peers. Um, we're going to show you another, I've got a bar graph here. This is superagers' performance compared to um, average 50 to 60-year-olds and then compared to average 80-year-olds and where higher numbers are better. So you see that those superagers are performing well. You'll notice I put up some demographics. We've enrolled about 85 superagers to date. Um, you'll see pretty quickly that there's more women than men up there, so I'll go ahead and preemptively answer the question that you might be wondering out there. Um, are more women superagers than men? Do they have some sort of advantage? Um, I think that's a bit unclear, so I think there's a few things that might be driving this. One, women tend to live a little bit longer than men, so that might be leading to part of the bias, but two, and maybe more importantly, Women tend to volunteer for research a bit more than men. So if you're sitting in the audience and you're a man, think about volunteering for research. If you're a woman sitting in the audience, also think about volunteering for research. Um, we have a, a mix, a, a range in education. So not all of the superagers that we enroll are doctors and lawyers. Um, and most of the superagers come from the Chicago land um, area or surrounding states, although we have a couple who have come to us from Texas. Um, I wasn't able to bring a superager here with me today, and there are oh so many stories to tell, but we have been um, lucky to have some good media coverage, and so I thought I'd share a, a brief video um, about one of the superagers. Uh, 
it isn't something that I trained for uh, or, or went to school for. Uh, it just happened. And, and I have no idea why, but I, I'm extremely grateful that at this age that I'm able to, to uh, care for myself. And although I live with my daughter and her family, uh, I could just as easily live independently at this stage of my life. And, and as I mentioned, I live with my daughter and her husband and their three children. And so that's, uh, I have to adapt to that kind of life. Uh, they don't know much about Frank Sinatra, or, uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So you have to, I have to keep saying, is Chance the Rapper uh, coming this week, or is it Taylor Swift? So I do have to ask those kind of questions to be relevant in the family. And, and I have uh, said to myself, could it be my diet? And, and my daughter would say, you had the worst diet. Uh, Dad, I have no idea how people, you know, who eat um, uh, TV dinners every night for many years, um, you shouldn't still be alive reading. <laughs> and, and of course, the TV and the internet. I think the internet is so remarkable because you can ask questions that uh, years ago, we would never have been able to find the answers. So. So those things are all remarkable. So hopefully that gives you a, a little flavor of the type of people that were enrolling in the study. And there are just countless other stories from there. Um, so when we think about superaging, one of the, the questions that might come to mind if you're a little bit skeptical, you could say, well, maybe everyone just had a lucky memory day when they came in. And if you brought them back a bit later, um, they wouldn't be doing so well. And so we did a study a few years ago that showed when we brought um, people back over an 18-month interval that they were able to maintain that memory performance. And I wanted to show you one more piece of data. Um, and this is from an individual that we've been able to follow for more than seven and a half years. And they've been able to maintain that outstanding memory performance year after year from age 80 to 87. Um, and we see this quite commonly in our cohort. So it's, it doesn't necessarily seem to be a fluke in this group. Um, but that's one of the questions we asked and answered. The next question we asked was, all right, so what does their brain look like? Does it look more like the 50-year-olds who they match in memory to, or more like the 80-year-olds that they match in age to? And so you might not have known this when you walked in today, but we're also going to now do a quick brain imaging tutorial about how we process brain images. So we start with a, well, first we collect the image from the MRI scanner, and then we process it through a fancy computer algorithm, and then it spits out an image like this. And again, it's as if we're cutting down here and looking forward, and you might be able to see some kind of faint red and yellow lines up there. The red line is outlining the outer edge of the brain, and then the uh, yellow line is, is uh, separating what we call the gray matter from the white matter. You guys are going to be neuroscientists before we leave. And um, what we're looking for is the distance between the red and yellow lines. And here it is blown up a little bit here because that's telling us the thickness of the gray matter. And the gray matter is where our brain cells live. And by measuring that thickness, it gives us a proxy measure of the health of the brain. We can do that for each individual, and then we can combine all of that information and compare one group to another group, and we get a map like this. When we get that map, we get a lot of red and yellow coloring up there, and those would be areas where red and yellow represents where one group is thinner than the others. So this isn't the real result. I'm just getting you prepped. OK, so for the first comparison, what we did is we compared those average 80-year-olds to average 50-year-olds. And what we saw when we did that is a lot of red and yellow coloring across the brains. We were not the first ones to do this. This is something that's been shown by other groups, but was sort of um, a gut check for us to make sure our data were in order. And we see that there's changes across the, the surface of the brain. There's thinning that happens uh, with age. And here is, uh, we're, we're looking at the front of the brain, and we're looking from the side this time. And then this would be the back of the brain. Now, when we make that same comparison with superagers versus the 50 to 60-year-olds, 
the picture is quite different. There's no red and yellow coloring up there because, in fact, there was no difference in the thickness between the superagers who are above age 80 and those 50 to 60 year olds. And then something even more shocking happened when we looked at what we call the medial surface of the brain. So now we have two kind of matching lobes of our brain. If you split them open and look deep inside, we saw something that was blue. And blue wasn't part of our tutorial a second ago. But blue actually means that the superagers had a thicker part of their brain than those 50 to 60 year olds. So this is usually the point where someone will say, what is that region? Can I buy one? How do I get one? What does it do? Is it good for me? Um, and it turns out that I have the answers to some of those questions, but not all of them. Um, that region is the anterior cingulate, and we know that it's very important for attention, and attention is critical for memory. So you have to be paying attention to something to actually remember it. So if you are focused on the Wisconsin football game and they scored a touchdown, then you might not hear the grocery list that your wife was telling you. Some, something like that. Um, so a lot of this finding of the anterior cingulate um, led us to look under the microscope, and I'm going to share some of those results with you in just a second. But before I share that, in case I still have... there. Um, we now also had another question about the brain and its structure. So if... What, how are they able to maintain this um, brain that's no thinner than their peers? Is it that they were just born with, with bigger brains? Or is it they, they were somehow resistant to changes in, brain, uh, in their brain size over time? And so the ideal way to answer this question would be to have MRI scans from birth in each decade subsequent. We don't have that. But a substitute can be to look um, prospectively going forward and to look at the change in brain size over time. And so we did that for a group of average 80-year-olds and then again for the superagers. And when we compare the rate of thinning of the brain over time, we see that the rate of thinning in the superagers is nearly two and a half times, or sorry, the, the rate of thinning in the cognitively average group is nearly two and a half times greater than the superagers. So this tells us that the superagers' brains are shrinking at a much slower rate. They seem to be, their, their brain changes are on a different trajectory, a different path. So now let's talk about that microscope data. One of the first questions we asked when we looked at the superaging data was, do superagers have more von Economo neurons? So neurons are just a fancy name for brain cells. And von Economo, in, there are many different types of neurons in the brain. And they are described either by their shape or their size or their function. And it turns out that von Economo neurons are kind of a less well-known neuron. They're more recently discovered and described. Um, so many neuroscientists wouldn't even know about them. Um, they have a lot of unique features, and I'm going to share a couple of them with you. One of them is that they're very large neurons. So um, we often think about pyramidal neurons being some of the largest cells in the brain, but von Economo neurons are even bigger than that. And then the other, uh, another really unique thing about them is that they've only been described in two parts of the brain. And one of those parts is the anterior cingulate. So this might ring some bells now. We just talked about that anterior cingulate being bigger in the superagers than the 50-year-olds. And so when we were looking at this region, we could kind of see um, uh, that there was an abundance of von Economo neurons, and we wanted to count them. So we had a very uh, wonderful graduate student who spent a lot of time in front of the microscope counting them for us, uh, Tamar Geffen. And the other unique thing about von Economo neurons is that they've only been described in higher order species, and species that tend to um, have strong social relationships or social um, affiliative behaviors. The last unique thing about um, von Economo neurons is that the loss or abnormal development of von Economo neurons, or VENs, um, has been associated in autism, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and frontotemporal dementia. So we think they may have something to do with socialization and also may um, inadvertently support memory. So when we look at the number of von Economo neurons in superagers, do you think that there's more? four to five times more in superagers compared to average elderly. And we followed this study up 
um, with another study looking across the lifespan, and it seems like superagers also have more von Economo neurons than even t some 20-year-olds, average 20-year-olds. So this might be something um, that they developed early on, um, and we're, we're still learning more about the importance of these cells and their uniqueness in superagers. So now we're gonna do a big transition and get away from uh, cells and microscopes and talk about psychosocial factors. So we uh, asked the superagers to fill out a questionnaire about psychological well-being. And um, this scale had uh, six different subscales looking at positive relations with others, purpose in life, self-acceptance, autonomy, environmental mastery, and personal growth. And we had superagers fill out this questionnaire and average agers fill out this questionnaire. And what we saw is that superagers tended to endorse more positive relationships with others. So what does this mean if we boil it down? Um, it means that uh, when you're thinking about calling that friend of yours this afternoon, that maybe it not only ha makes you feel good, but it also may have some benefit to your brain. So we know in a larger body of literature that there are negative consequences of loneliness. And we have also learned that there are positive consequences of social engagement. And so what our data do is they support that larger research talking about the importance of social engagement and that these superagers um, seem to endorse these positive relationships with others to a higher degree. We don't know yet whether they have more friends or for some people if they just feel like those um, relationships are, they have a small circle with close relationships and this is something that we'll follow up with and learn about more. Um, but this does seem to be a, a difference between the groups. So to kind of summarize where, where we've been so far, we see that um, in the super aging group, we ask the question, is it possible to have this outstanding memory performance um, over age 80? And the answer there is yes. Superaging is a rare possibility. And I use the word rare because we have screened well over 1,500 people at this point, and we've only found 85 people who kind of meet criteria for our uh, study. We don't look at this as a bad thing. Instead, we look at it as a positive thing because we're looking for um, really people who are in this rare population and when they have something in common with each other, it may be more meaningful for, to be a, a, a modifiable factor that could be useful for others. The next thing that we asked is, are there biological factors and, and psychosocial factors that contribute to outstanding uh, mental acuity? And here again, we say, yes, there seem to be some biologic and psychosocial factors associated with being a superager. And one of those things was that their, their brain structure seems to be, be a bit different. Um, they have better what we call cortical integrity. Um, that outer layer of the brain seems to be thicker. They have more von Economo neurons. And then uh, they, their psychological well-being seems to differentiate the groups. So if we played a game and said, well, well what causes this? Is it resilience, resistance, or luck? Um, we might say that superagers' cortex seems to be resistant to the changes that happen with time. The von Economo neurons may be lucky. That might be a genetic factor that they're, um, that's allowing them to have these, uh, this abundance of von Economo neurons. We don't know yet. Um, and then psychological well-being, I put the word resilience, and I put that for a couple of reasons. I haven't really explained that yet, but we see that the superagers, um, a question that will come up is, have they just all had really easy lives? Has this been, um, is that what helped them get along? Is that they have never had any trials or tribulations? And we see that that's not the case. In fact, the superagers uh, report very traumatic events happening in their life and have uh, lived through many hardships. But what they do seem to do is they move on, and they push through, and they're resilient to the effects of those. So they take a bad situation, and they find that positive moment in it. And so I think that's another thing that we can think about in our, other, in our everyday life, is that our attitude might matter in how we're aging and help us to accelerate um, to, that, to that healthy aging lifestyle. And so I know we're going to have a um, Q&A at the end, but I thought I would kind of preempt that by uh, going over the top five questions that people ask me about superagers. And so one of those is, do they exercise often? 
and we see that there's a little bit of a mixture there, um, but more than 80% of them report that they currently exercise in some way. That could be stretching for some, it could be weightlifting for others. Some of them are, re uh, are, are leading their exercise classes, um, but there are others who have very firmly told me that they are not exercising, they don't plan to start exercising, <laughs> and don't ask them any more about that. So, um, quite clear. Okay, so do they smoke or drink? Um, so we have greater than 70% who re uh, report past tobacco use. I do not think that this means that we should go buy a pack of cigarettes um, and start smoking. There's certainly a strong literature that suggests that smoking is not good for us. But I put that up there to also let you know these aren't individuals who have necessarily led pristine lives where they have had a vegetarian diet and done all of the right things, that they're normal folks just like you or I. Um, do they currently drink? This is also another kind of fun one and a divider. So we uh, ask the superagers from time to time, why do you think you're a superager? And we have two women who very firmly tell me, Dr. Rogalski, it's because I have a martini every day at five o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm also not endorsing that, but <laughs> just sharing what they say. Um, when do they retire? So we have some superagers who are still working. Um, and uh, about greater than 15% who report that they're still working. We have, um, and then many of the others who aren't maybe working at their first career may have picked up a second career or are volunteering and also very active in their community in some way. So these are active folks who are participating in whatever way is most meaningful to them at this point in their life. They are busy, so we are lucky to get them in for our research um, uh, studies uh, around their very busy schedule. So the next one, do they eat a lot of blueberries? <laughs> I think it's easy to, um, <laughs> to get distracted by all of the marketing on the internet who, that would lead you to believe that if you take this one pill or you eat these 10 blueberries, then you will be protected for, forever from whatever ailment is out there. Um, but more seriously, we do see some variety in the superagers' diets. You saw in the video um, that Mr. Tim Brunzel um, does not particularly have a great diet, according to his daughter. Um, but we do have some individuals who um, have uh, been vegetarians or maybe led a more healthful diet. Uh, this is not the study to be definitive about the precise diet you should lead. We do know that a heart-healthy diet is uh, synonymous with a, a brain-healthy diet, and we'll learn a little bit more about that, I believe, um, in one of the uh, next talks. And then this is my shameless plug. Um, I think I know a superager. How, how can he or she enroll? We are still looking for superagers, and so if anyone does want to take a trip down to Chicago for a, it's just a short ride down the road um, for a vacation, um, we'd be glad to hear from you and have you enroll in our study. Um, and last but not least, um, there's a lot of thank yous to be given, um, one to the team of researchers that I work with that help to prepare all of these data, but first and foremost to those superagers. And so this is a picture actually from just a couple weeks ago. Um, a few years ago, the superagers uh, started demanding that they wanted to meet each other um, <laughs> for a variety of reasons. Um, <laughs> Not the least of which, one told me, well, I lost my spouse and I'm looking for a new one. <laughs> and I thought a superager might make a good fit. So um, I'm not becoming Match.com, but um, they, really, they really are an amazing group of individuals and we have a lot of fun. And we got them together a few weeks ago for some cocktails and music. And it's really been fun to see how they've become friends over the years. And I feel really lucky to have had the time to spend with them um, and the ability to learn from them. So uh, a great thank you to them and thank you uh, to you for your time. <laughs>